Hi, thanks for joining. I'm Katie Hooten, head of studio here at the LA MPC Visualization Studio. And we're a unique studio in the company because we get involved very early in the production process. We kick off development, do some pre-production, see it through all the way to finals at different inflection points throughout the pipeline. Today we're discussing how we serve the story using visual tools. And I have some experts with me from the studio, familiar faces here in LA. We have Leon Lagrange, our art director, and we have Patrick Smith, our head of visualization. Let me give some quick intros. Leon has been working for MPC art department since 2014, tackling visual development from pitch and pre-production to post-production. You have an expertise in both 2D and 3D design techniques and came from a VFX background, which I'm sure Indeed. comes into play yeah. on a daily basis. For sure, yeah. <laughs> Patrick has held a number of senior positions within the industry, providing visualization leadership on some of the biggest blockbusters in the feature space, bringing cutting edge tech to traditional visualization. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump in. So though we are part of a VFX company and definitely a part of the VFX system, we have an identity that is a bit more of a storytelling service rather than VFX. So how does that work for us? Why do we consider ourselves part of the storytelling launch? In the art department, although we are very definitely conscious about the craftsmanship and how you need to master you know, art and drawing and all those mediums, the first thing that we're really paying attention to is stories and how we can help you know, our clients, directors, and filmmakers to really sell their story and tell their story. And, and that's the first thing we are very conscious about. And art is definitely needs to be following. It's a given. You need to be very fluent with your medium. But the first thing we should be concerned about is helping to tell a story. That's great. And Patrick, how are you impacted in your department by pursuing story first and then bringing your tools second. Every artist that I talk to has to be a storyteller up front. Uh, they can be generalists, they can be strong animators, they can do wonderful and beautiful things through visual cinematography, but I encourage all of my artists to be storytellers up front because we come on so early in the pipeline, it's important for them to help facilitate, be problem solvers and creative collaborators at that table to figure out oh, what's this character's motivation for the sequence that will help define what their action is. So having a sense of storytelling and being a filmmaker up front is paramount to any animation or camera work or lighting that you can do. Although those things, the technical skills are huge, massive facilitators in helping to springboard the, the, the actual deliverable that you get at the end of the day. So let's spend some time focusing in on the art department. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put some words back to you that you have said before. <laughs> <laughs> so you've described the development process as a small window in time when you can explore and dream. And it's right at the beginning, that's the best time to do it. Yeah. So tell us about how you begin to connect with the work and what exploring and dreaming happens as you figure out where you can help. Our jumping points are all, all around and we can start very, very early on and, you know, it can be maybe there's no script yet and it's just ideas and we're helping for pitch, you know, pitching uh, the movie and so we would come and try to convey what would the look of a film look like with just a few images and very to the point, it can also be just a one piece of design, maybe what is the main character, you know, look like and all those things will be worked on later on as pre-production comes in, but at that point we're trying to synthesize what could that movie be and help the filmmaker to sell that to a studio and just push their ideas forward because the thing is when they come to us most of the time they have, you know, inspirations, they have reference that they've been through, they have ideas, but we are the, the first link to those visuals moments. It's the first time they're going to start seeing what they have in their head on the paper and so it, those early moments are very important and so pitch can be you know that and then after that we would just follow up in pre-production which pre-production is very much the core of what we're doing and that is establishing visual language that would serve the story and then using those rules and the visual language to apply it to design tasks and that can be really anything in the film it could be character design costumes creatures environment 
um, it's a very broad, uh, broad area, and quite often there's a lot of art department involved all over to really piece together the whole movie. The good thing also is that we can do that through the lens of very different sensibilities, because all our artists are coming from everywhere, uh, you know, in the globe, and so they have different sensibility, and we can provide so much more uh, fresh ideas, you know, um, using those bright minds. And you know, when we're through pre-production, then we do the follow-up into post-production, where at that point, you know, things have been, you know, shot. They have visual effects going, and we are really here to help, you know, our, our sister companies and visual effects to really um, understand what it is we are trying to design. So we're doing follow-up with them. We're also here to bring support if they need some extra design work that needs to be done, like helping with set extensions and painting over over render story that they've done. Um, and, and then sometimes at the very last minute we have some complete redesign to do because this happens, so we, we also jump in late sometimes. Not ideal, right? Not ideal. And but that's why we talk about the, like the dreaming and the exploration up front because you limit the choices as you get further down into you know, plates that have already been shot and yeah. trying to troubleshoot from uh, kind of coming at it from behind rather than up front. Yeah, I, I think the name of the game really is to kind of, at the very beginning, at the early stage, to, to create those, those rules and those visual language and those you know, moments of even you know, poetry and emotion that are strong enough that they can hold through you know, the rationalization of like a whole movie pipeline, right? And, and there's so many departments, so many people coming and working that if those ideas are not strong enough, you're going to lose them throughout. And then as you reach the end of it, it's going to be something that might be shapeless or uninteresting. And so you really have to get something strong enough at the beginning that can hold throughout the movie all the way to VFX. And, and sometimes a keyframe piece that yeah. really tells a story in one image can yeah. actually be a North Star for an entire sequence where exactly. you keep coming back mm -hmm. to that same image because it's yeah. so impactful. And it, it, all the time we see that happen with a filmmaker coming back to that one moment and say, but I, that's what I like. So everybody has to kind of, yeah, narrow down on this. And sometimes it's, it could also be an image that was done very quickly, it's not necessarily something that needs to be labeled. It's, it's just a, an inspiration or that generate, you know, that perfect emotion that they're trying to capture for that scene. And, and that becomes, yeah, the, the, you know, what everybody is trying to follow and capture. Something we don't talk about too much, but we will let our secrets out here, is when you're meeting a new client that you haven't worked with in the past, there's a bit of even a point of view assessment that's happening. Like how married are they to a, specific comp of other films or have yeah. they done their own mood boards have they done their own research yeah. some of your collaborators come with like a massive amount mm -hmm. of visuals they want you to look at others it's yeah. like a treatment and you really have to pull from them so what's yeah. that process like extracting from them their vision yeah it's it's you know it, it goes back to again how you know skillful you are with expressing yourself with visual language because at the very beginning of that process whatever art we are, we're designing, we're creating, is really just us asking questions to the director. Hey, what do you think about that? Or what do you think about those colors or that design? And, the, and we're not re really aiming there to solve the problem right away. We're just trying to understand where they're coming from and what they're trying to say. And, and that's very much the first part of it. And then as we progress and we start to get no, narrow down those ideas and how they you know, feel about the film and what they want to say, then we start to create images to actually solve, answer those questions. And so we're starting to get into more of the design part of it. it it's always kind of a dance between asking questions and solving problems. And yeah. So yeah. Let's talk a little bit about character design. Mm -hmm. Because I know when you, sometimes you're brought iconic characters to mm -hmm. redesign to be reimagined into mm -hmm. a feature space. Mm -hmm. And when doing that, I've seen you take like a cartoon character, for example, down mm -hmm. to its bone structure, then its mm -hmm. muscles, mm -hmm. and then be able to put the skin on it to show mm -hmm. how it will move and operate. Sometimes clients are even like, whoa, we don't want to see the bones. <laughs> we didn't ask yeah. for this. <laughs> He's made of jello. <laughs> yeah, but um, talk about that process in terms of having to have literal um, physiology work behind how you put that character into a real world scenario. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's for us, it also helps us understand the character itself. So it, it's something that we do to 
to kind of rationalize what that character is about. And so when we do those types of work, we're trying to, you know, we're working from an IPA. That's something we're trying to respect. So we're really taking that um, and focusing on it and then trying to get to that rationalization. So we're starting to think about the weight of the character, how the character moves, and we're studying the IPA. But being able to go there is going to be very helpful later on for the VFX people because they're going to have to figure those out you know, realistically. They're going to have to build that thing. They're going to have to put a skeleton in it and animate it. And so for us already early on starting to understand what the character is, it just gives them you know, a bit of a head start when they start to actually build the character. So quite often we, we do sculptures as well to just help to understand the volume and the proportions. And, and in some instances, we even went to VR space to look at the creature. And in, in that instance, it was a creature to understand the size of it and what that means to, you know, how the angles at which, you know, the, the creature is going to be shot at. And so it's all those rationalization of, uh, you know, an idea or concept or an IP that we're doing in, uh, at, that, at that point. And obviously, after that, it goes to, you know, more like um, accurate reference of textures and colors and and it's a it's a process from something very cartoony maybe and two dimensional to something that feels very realistic and complex and then going back to that problem solving perspective you don't want to design something that doesn't serve the production later down the line so yeah. i've seen you do designs for example um, creature designs where they might have um, extra appendages or might have things that retract and you really have to do a study on uh, opening up your imagination to see how do these extra things on this creature really function when the creature is more approachable or when the creature is attacked you know yeah. all those experiences yeah yeah I mean really our goal is to provide as much information as we can so we don't have like bad surprises down the line right so we we do a lot of those studies we do some keyframes of like moments like that are specific to that creature and how can we show all the facets and of the of the creature and quite often it's also why we're doing those sculptures because it helps solving problems three-dimensionally and we know we're not ignoring sometimes when you draw you draw that ideal moment of a creature right you just hide things that you don't want to see and and so doing it in volume is is very helpful and quite often when we don't have the the 3d totally established uh, we'll have to go back and revisit the design later on so that's why we're trying to narrow down and, and iron out all those questions as early as possible so um, some of your tools might be starting from sketch and yeah. then taking it through to a more painterly look and then trying to experience it in a 3d what are some yeah. of the tools that you use to take it in that progression quite often we start pencil on paper and just to get very quick ideas and it's also for us to assess how our client responds to a certain medium. Some are not really interesting to look at pencil and paper. Some want to see something more finished. It really depends the stage at which we are in the design. But quite often it would be ideas, pencil and paper. Then we start to put some colors and we do a painterly rendering of what it could be. Um, then we could move to 3D and, and start to really figure out the volume and we can also play with the lighting at that point is how does our design react to different light conditions and lighting scenarios and, and depending on you know what that scene that the creature is on if it's a creature you know what that scene is meant to be what lighting are we going to see the creature uh, into so we do all those things and then you know often if we want to push it all the way to final we would actually do some pretty you know pushed renders of, of that model and then we just paint over to get the realistic look of, of the creature. So it's kind of a, most of the time if we go from very pre-production to post-production, that's kind of the process. So then by the time they have to build it, they already have a model that they can start from. So they don't have to interpret a 2D drawing. Sometimes there can be some problems if, you know, when you go through interpretation. and. Uh, and then if there is any issues at that point, sometimes the, the render comes back to us that the model that is done in post-production and then we paint over, we, we help them figure out what's missing in the design or what they cannot understand. And that's why it's important to have that follow-up from pre-production to post-production. We can get the art direction going and answer any question that they might have so they don't have to, to waste time and, and do multiple you know, paths of reviews and things like that. So you have an amazing team. 
that <laughs> I've relied on many times, I know well. We've talked a bit about what it takes to work sort of at this prestige level mm -hmm. to be a problem solver in the space, mm -hmm. and it's really more than artistic talent. You're looking yeah. for other qualities in your artists, so tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, again, Art is the medium, right? But the real job is to solve the problems. And, and so it is visual problem. We are solving with visual tools. But when you know, a filmmaker come to us, there's a whole set of questions and issues and unknown that we, that we have to answer to and we have to solve. And so an artist uh, you know, in, in our art department is really a problem solver. And art obviously needs to be there, and that's, that's a given. But when we design, when we approach designs, and when it's first of all solving those problems, and it's for us to define. It could be a design, it could be a composition, it could be an image. Everything is subservient to that storytelling moment, right? What we're trying to do or to say. We always keep the big picture, which is, you know, what are the emotions we're trying to generate uh, with that image or that design. Uh, and, you know, we. An image is worth a thousand words, right? So that's, that's the richness that we have there with the visual tools and the visual language. Um, but what's important is the thoughts and how you think and how you approach the design. Looking at reference, always be you know, curious, looking at nature. It's researching, and that's why we're creating mood boards. We are asking all those questions. We're pushing you know, every artist to always go to like, the freshest ideas they can find, like the new things. Anything that we can, you know, think about. Most of the time, everything that comes from your mind right away is probably not the right answer. It's something deri derivative that you know of, that you've seen. And, and by having that curious mind and digging in, then you start getting to those interesting answers. And to go there, you really need to have that problem-solving mind. It's not about making a beautiful picture. It's really just about solving those problems in the more original way that we can. And you know, clients, of course, they have, they're waiting for us to you know, answer uh, to their demand, but we're also here to bring them something that's unexpected sometimes. There's, we always do those versions where we answer a brief, and then we have those where we go beyond the brief, and we're trying to give them a fresh perspective on, on you know, what it is that we're trying to design. Just to, it's a collaboration, just to you know, push them as well. As much as they push us, we, we do the same thing, and it's really, yeah, just a collaboration. And you've said, in the end, it's about emotion. And so sometimes yeah. you'll produce an image that your client can't even put their finger on why yeah. they love it so much and why that's the touch point. But it's because mm -hmm. you've tapped into something, right? Yeah, yeah. And at, at that point, it's, um, you know, that's for us to figure out what works and what, what, what doesn't. And that's really, again, part to that curious mind and that problem solving is that how much do we control our images and how, how much are we able to understand what works and what doesn't. And that's where you start creating those visual rules we are talking about, is understanding what it is that works and how we can replicate it for other designs throughout the film to perpetuate that direction and that emotion. And, and also being able to go the opposite way if suddenly you know, the next scene is different and we're trying to do the, you know, we're saying something different. So it's that understanding of our medium, obviously, but it's subservient to the story. So I've heard you say your effort is to get to the visual language as soon as possible. Get mm -hmm. out of the words and get into mm -hmm. uh, looking at something together that you can agree on is in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So what are the elements of your consideration to get to that visual state? Yeah, I think what, what we need to consider in the end is how everything comes together. So, you know, there is the, for us on our side very quickly, the visual language and the mood and you know, how, how do we frame film? When, when, we, when we're starting to create, you know, keyframe for sequences, we straight away go to lighting, framing, and, and, and you know, all of this is very much uh, a, a driving force, right, to those emotions. But then after that, we, you know, comes to play, and this is something for us, it's a bit harder to tap on, the rhythm and, and, and all those, you know, the movement and all of this that starts to slip away a little bit and that's when you know other departments just jump in and, and, and start answering those questions and again it's another level of problem solving that is meant to just really help enhance the story and, and tell the story. 
Well, let's talk a little visualization. Let's do it. So even though Previs is cemented in the filmmaking process now, I still find myself explaining to people what it is because it's not necessarily familiar to everyone. And we were talking about this back in early 2000s, the first time I ever heard about Previs from a VFX house, I was like, why would you get the fast food version of the actual meal you want to eat later? Right. How about just serve me that meal? I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so it was a little confusing, like why do we do this intermediate stage, but it's so much more than that, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah, and that's, I honestly, when I first got into it as well, I had the same exact mindset, was just looking at the deliverable and you're like, uh, it's a way to get into movies, I guess, but I don't necessarily know if I wanna do that. Yeah. Um, and for me, when I first got into it, I had that light bulb moment myself when you realize, oh my God, I'm getting to work on some of the biggest films that are coming out. And not only that, I'm sitting at the, as close to the front end as possible with those creative filmmakers. I get to sit with people that I've, you know, idolized and wanted to learn from and sponge off of. And so it's not just that, but it is the creative decision making that's, that's still so open at that point. I, I just had a mindset when I first came to Hollywood, like, oh my God, a director and a writer sit down in a room, they write a movie and it's done. It's locked in, they just go to shoot and it's created in this vacuum, right? And it's that movie from start to finish. And I think what all of us tend to realize when we get into it is it's an, it's an evolving, living animal. It, it's, it's constantly, you're sculpting and you're trying to find what it is, narrow down what the story is. So to be able to, to sit there and be a facilitator in that world, I think that that was my moment, my epiphany, where I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Forget animating a, a character for months on end. It's like, this is what I want to be a part of. I want to have a voice at that table. I want to be sitting there with those collaborators. And actually, there's a part of Previs where failure is baked into the process. You want that failure. Fail 100%. fast, fail often. Yeah, we, right. we constantly talk about the sandbox of ideas, right? It's a creative sandbox of ideas. And it is this sculpting process, it is prototyping and being able to rapidly iterate these ideas quickly in a space where they have that kind of creative womb, that moment before you actually have to go to set and you have an army of people looking at you and money is shooting through the roof, right? It's like this is that moment you have in time where you get to sculpt and find and kind of sift through the ideas to, to find like, this is it. And you can get fooled is like that you know you're looking for this golden nugget in this and what this sequence should be and you go down a rabbit hole and you figure out like oh my god that was that's not it and you find where it is you find you you sculpt it out to figure out like this is actually what i'm looking for out of this sequence this underlines so much of this character's art or this humanizes this villain to to make us feel bad for him for later on the setup that that reverses the roles um it's a, it's a really interesting process, and I feel just like you did getting into it, was people look at the deliverable and they're missing in that, what that sifting of ideas and, and being able to play in that sandbox looks like to take everyone's concept from all these different departments weighing in. Stunts wants to show off their fight choreography. Wardrobe is leaning over your shoulder, like, wouldn't it be cool if you got my dress in there? That'd be great. <laughs> um, it's the first time that you really get to see your film moving in a 3D space, and that's where I feel like there's so much overlap between what our departments are doing. Uh, your team of artists will, will develop a beautiful concept, and then we can start to breathe the 3D world into that. What does this look like if we you know, put the camera over here from this 2D image? This is the first time when you know, just ink and, and paper come to life, and you start to see a real, like, this is what our movie could be. Are we underlining the tone of what the movie is? Are we touching on the camera language of what we want to what we want to say with this film? And there's no one thing that Previs has to be, right? It kind of takes the personality on of the director or the need, right? You've had, you've worked with many oh, yeah. different personality types where some directors might be more technical, some might be more from a comedy and improv background. And so how does that make a difference with the style of previs you're providing for them? So it's not only that you have to be nimble and agile in the world of, of having a deep creative bag to pull from. How do we creatively problem solve this one issue that we're running into, right, with this story thing? You have to be creative and nimble in the working with different personality types of, of, of their approach. Uh, this director knows absolutely, I've boarded every single shot, I know exactly what I'm looking for, I just want to see it moving in 3D, we can put it together and that's what I want. 
another one, uh, we want to sift through all those thousands of ideas. Previs is a wild evolving animal in itself too. We've worked on films. When I first started, it was kind of these hand-picked little VFX sequences. Oh, let's do this one and let's do that one. And it's since evolved now into, we'll do upwards of 2,000 shots of the film, 1,500 shots, 2,000 shots, no problem. And not only that, we'll iterate those, we'll iterate those shots over and over and over to find it. It's all built into the, the system work with comedy improv directors where they want to find like what is the best joke and even even when they go through 10,000 iterations of like what that joke is it still may evolve because that movie is a moving living thing it will move into post and we'll find it we'll, we'll circle back with them and find it in post even just the approach of which director you sit down with which team of artists you sit down with you have to be nimble and agile in that world too to, to have a different style different camera languages all that stuff yeah Let's talk a little bit about the artists that you work with because you have artists that are coming from different places in within maybe animation or visual effects. And just like we talked with in the art department with Leon, it's not necessarily a proficient animator right. that's going to excel in the visualization space. Yes, it is very true, extremely true. No true words have been spoken. It's a challenge because it's almost just now being taught in schools. And, and for the early days, for the early folks that got into visualization, it was this kind of zigzag path, much like myself. I, would, I came out here to be an animator, found this, and was like, oh, I had my light bulb moment. So it's this kind of zigzag of finding your path into visualization. We'll get people that are character animators. We'll get people that have want to be directors in their own right, and they are an beautiful visual storytellers through the camera lens. but they have a challenge of animating. So it's what we try and look for are these generalist mindsets, right? These people that can handle a little bit of everything. You don't necessarily need to be proficient at just this one thing, but we need to have a little bit of a, a wider skill set. You need to be a little bit of a Swiss army knife because we'll have teams, these kind of small little elite tactical teams. This guy's great at animation and this guy's really good at effects and put them all together and they can create beautiful story for you. And it's sort of understanding what makes a cinematic moment? Why does this shot deserve to live within the story structure? I, it, for me, the, it's always hearkening back to that, is you may be a fantastic animator. I've seen so many people jump from the final side and they can breathe life into these characters that you wouldn't believe, but you have to understand visual storytelling. And at the, at the very end of the day, it's, it's to what you said. It's, mm -hmm. it's can you pick a compelling angle that, that not only frames this character in a particular light, but it's underlining the, the struggle that they're having in the film. And, it, and depending on how you shoot that, it's down to what lenses you pick for your camera. It's down to, are they the backlit? Are they, are they, is there a key light on them? On their, on, is there a three point lighting system, system set up? It's like figuring out kind of how all of those things come into play. And without saying a single word, it is, it is the visual, uh, a picture paints a thousand words. It, it's, you're telling a story just based on where you place the camera. If you place the camera low looking up at someone or high, it visually changes what that is. So i a huge proponent for pushing on all of my artists. You have to understand visual storytelling. You have to understand the three-act structure, the hero's journey, character arc, character flaws. All of these things come into play when it's not just sequence building. It's not just designing a cool shot or animating something that's really neat or, or has life to it. What, are you, what story are you telling at the, the micro level of your shot, but also the macro level of the overall sequence, the macro level of how does this work into the film? Where does this come into play? It's, it's really interesting. And there's so much benefit once you have the pieces in place and you can start to work with your sequence structure, you can bring pacing, uh, you can play with it. Tone can change radically depending on sound cues that you put in uh, or where you choose to move the camera or have it linger for a while with a certain situation. Absolutely. Those, a lot of those questions you like to you ask up front. And you, you want to sit down and immerse yourself with the director and, and, and the visual effects supervisor. What, what story are we trying to tell here? What's the story versus the plot? You want to figure out what is the tone of this film? Are we going for like the, the fun-loving comedy? Is this something that's more dark and mysterious? Because that helps to inform like how that camera will actually move. What are these characters thinking in this moment? Uh, it's, it's, yes, it's paramount, I believe. So we've talked a bit that there's a phrase people use, fix it in pre, 
Which is true. All of these things you point to, making decisions early benefits the rest of the production sure. down the line. But post-vis is kind of having a moment and not everybody knows what post-vis can be used for. So I wanted you to talk a bit about what is post-vis and why is it having a boom right now? I mean, you, you've got so much going on in the post-vis space, which I think is is uh, really timely. It's true, yeah, absolutely. There's, it, it's such an important component to that movie making process at this point that your crew has gone and shot their film, right? They, they're coming back and now they're kind of putting all the pieces back together that will tell this story. And sometimes the, you know, the movie that you shoot is not necessarily the movie that was scripted and it's this, still, this living animal and it's breathing. Um, we need to be facilitators in helping to bridge that gap. There'll be months at a time before you see your first round of turnover from visual effects. And if you're trying to put together a movie that has nothing but blue screens in the background and it's always a, you find yourself giving the preamble of like, imagine if you will, there's a giant dragon in the back. It's like, to help facilitate those storytellers, we are right there with them still in this process, being nimble, being agile. Uh, tracking cameras, pulling green screens, adding in that CG dragon in the background to like help inform and tell the story. That way the director can sit with us and the editor and say like, is this, is, are we hitting the mark here? What are we missing? Uh, not only that, but there is a, a virtual gauntlet of screenings that you have to run through before you're, you know, you're testing it. Is like, are we nailing it? Is, are these characters dynamic? Are they interesting? Do they have depth? Do they have texture? Um, and to help tell those stories, you need to be able to facilitate the visuals on screen. If you have an audience of people that are looking at just blue screens or tennis balls walking through or people in blue suits running through your shots, it's going to be wildly confusing. Uh, so we come in and we help facilitate and kind of act as their paintbrush and say, okay, what does that set extension look like? We work with our department still to get what those, the, the map painting might, the set extension and the map painting will look like in that background. We layer that in and it, it creates if you know if previs is the rough draft post viz is the final draft you're starting to kind of like edit you're finding those like areas that were a little bit more raw and you're starting to sure those up so i think it's it is a massive massive component to the movie making process i think to your point about why are we seeing such a boom of it right now is it's we're in a world, you know, we're still living in a world where, where a lot of our setups are remote and we need to help better inform kind of our friends on the other side in finals. Like, what is this, what is this sequence that we're developing? What is the story that we're telling? Um, and helping to give them that digital blueprint that looks like, okay, this is what everyone has agreed on. This is kind of where we are with this story. We're able to be nimble and quick in that world it still has that pre vis quality look, but we're able to help inform our friends and finals that'll breathe life into it and, and make it that fancy and glittery and have all the glitz and glamour to it. And again, with the mindset of using those tools to problem solve, mm -hmm. if there are new decisions to be made, if there are cuts to be made, expansions to be made that will benefit VFX finals, like this is the time to make those choices. Uh, that, absolutely true. It's it's you start to figure out very quickly that not only production is probably your most expensive part of the process, but certainly trying to change something in the finals process, which historically can be a pretty rigid linear process. Trying to go back to the drawing board in those phases can be very expensive for a, a movie in the back end. And we're able to be that facilitator. We're able to be that handshake between those two to help quickly course correct and say, no, 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 We're, we, we moved these two sequences around to play off each other, and we need what that bridge is to help cement this character's resolve. And here we kind of, we mock something up for you in that world to show what that looks like, that handoff looks like, and we can push that to them. That's the coolest part, is we can take that data and just hand that off to them, and boom, they're off and running. And you're, you're I always talk about this creative cliff, right? And, and you touched on this, ideas in this creative space are so fragile. You know, you want to you want to make sure that what you're you shouldn't be lobbing ideas over the fence because they are so like you want to protect them and take care of them. There are these fragile moments, and to be able to have that handshake th from the start to finish is is it helps to create this process where we're we're climbing this creative hill and there's not a huge drop off in what the first turnover from visual effects looks like. It is just an uh, we're stair stepping and we're helping each other to level up. I think that's such a huge component of what we're doing. So we can see that tech 
plays a strong role in this space, doing the problem solving, the technical planning. How have you seen your technical tools impact the ability to serve the story? Where is it right now? And how do you see it moving forward in the future? To go back to the sandbox analogy, it's, it's you're a kid playing in the sandbox and wouldn't it be cool if we can prototype and rapidly iterate those ideas quickly to have a deep toolbox next to your sandbox that allows you to give the, those creatives the tech that they want to evolve and take their process to the next level. Uh, that's what we're providing and it's, it's so much fun in that world. Um, there is, I think mocap is a, a brilliant one. It is, uh, okay, we have a five minute animatic that's just dropped on our desk on Monday morning and let's, hey, we need to crank this sequence out. How can we capture that quickly? Uh, it could take a team of artists a week, two weeks, to animate all of this out and, and to get uh, that idea figured out. Why not just pull a couple of your artists, throw on a mocap suit, run out to the parking lot, crank out some motion capture, boom, now you've, you've saved yourself that time. What you're doing with that is now you're allowed to focus on those creative filmmaking decisions. You're, you're not sitting there just grinding out animation. You're able to like, okay, let's figure out where these cameras should be set up. We want to tell a story with that. You're able, it's a force multiplier, which allows you to focus back to the story, back to creative decisions and filmmaking. Uh, maybe you have some really cool stunt viz that the client has provided you. Look at these guys running around in their, in their studio with sticks and you know, they have some amazing stunts they're doing. Let's throw those guys in the mocap suit. Bring them on down here or we'll go to them. Make it portable, make it accessible, make it you know, easy, easy and in. It's an easy win. There's a lot of curiosity about virtual production. 100%. And I know like there's different levels that you can go. And of course, this company has accomplished great things by going to the height of, right. of virtual production. But you use it all the time. And that's the, that's the beauty and where we are, I think, in filmmaking right now. There's the obviously we can go to a Lion King level. We can go to a Jungle Book level. But we're also at this creative crossroads in the, a world where content is coming out everywhere it's just raining content we're at this and, and technology has never been more accessible to in this world as well so it doesn't I think so many people are potentially scared off by the buzzword of like virtual production virtual production all oh, what does that mean I don't want to be bleeding money on set is there are so many real-time tools that are just out of the box whether it's mocap whether it's virtual camera setups we can do pop-up volumes that you know okay now we've taken all that mocap we've put it into a master scene file Let's start to lay in some cameras on it. Do you want to come down and do that? DP's interested in that. The director's coming down and, and laying in camera work. Not only that, I can sit there and work with my artists and you know they show me a shot. Oh no, that's not exactly what I was thinking. Boom, pop up an iPad. What do you think about this? Let's put a 50 on that and let's frame it like this. So it's, it's these more uh, budget friendly, kind of the out of the box stuff that we can leverage that are force multipliers to take it's no longer just letting a team of artists cook for a week and then come back and like, oh, that's not what I was thinking. Yeah. It's engaging those creatives more in those decisions, in that filmmaking process up front uh, when it still is like you're in that creative space to, to des design it for success. And we've experienced uh, a lot of progress with directors who they might come from a strong drama or thriller background. They don't necessarily have the VFX experience. And they might even say like, don't show me the back room. Like, I don't want to know how the sausage is made, but yeah. then you can put something very user friendly in their hands, like a V-pad, invite their cinematographer to be a part of the experience. And suddenly that changes things. I, I think that is one of the most important factors in this because we've seen so many creatives either shy away or their eyes glaze over when you start talking about voxels and like how much cool engineering tech is behind what we've created in the back room and they're like, like glaze yeah immediately <laughs> it's like how does this help my story i'm thinking about my character and what my character is thinking so to make that uh more user friendly to make it an, an easier invite is like hey look this is a video game controller i'm sure you've played video games in the past no all right great it's like but you figure it out real quick it's like what their comfort level is uh you can you know just show them like look it's just as simple as an ipad and you're looking around and you can really start to see your world come to life a couple of quick buttons boom take this ipad home over the weekend shoot some digital kind of capture we've we've encapsulated that scene file into this iPad. Why don't you take it home, 
snap some 3D screenshots of like what you think are the cool angles. We'll incorporate that back into the previs. It's it engages them more. And what I found is for a long time in the evolution of previs, we kind of got away from this idea of happy accidents, right? Like directors go out on set and they're scouting and they're finding, oh, this is an interesting angle. And I feel like there was a time, there was a period in, in visualization where it started to box people in. It was like, nope, this is the sequence you decided on and like, here's the shot and we're doing, these, these are our shoot days and all of that. Where this, what virtual production has provided, I believe, is this journey back to these happy accident moments where you can give them a set to scout ahead of time before, the, before anybody sets foot on the shoot before you know, the money starts to become an issue, here's a 3D rendering of your world. Go scout some locations, go find some stuff. Tell us what you think is cool and we'll work that in. It's, it's a really exciting moment in the filmmaking process as well as a renaissance of content creation, which is insane. So you guys know I'm a self-confessed movie nerd. I love movies, I'm in this business because of movies, not because of widgets or tools or services. <laughs> for sales. Um, but my favorite thing for us to talk about is how this methodology and the tools and the people come together to make that movie magic. We have some real specific examples where it's clicked and it's worked and you see your thumbprints on the films that are being put on into theaters. That's super exciting. Um, one of the things I find fascinating is your teams actually influence script. And I wonder, yeah. Leon, if you can tell a little bit about that and maybe toss to Patrick who can fill in because you both yeah. have experiences with where you're really connecting with the director, impacting story in a way that's yeah. lasting. Yeah, this is, this is one of the most rewarding things for us really is, you know, those moments of collaboration where really, you know, there's an openness in the way where, where you know, the director wants to proceed in creating his film where the way we answer his questions and we're helping solve those uh, designs uh, issues he's coming to us with uh, will definitely impact how he writes his film. So there is a back and forth on what we design and how he's implementing things in the script. And when we can be early enough that we're part of those conversations, it's so much fun and it's so rewarding because really we're helping really shape the, the nature of the script and the scenes. and. And, and we, get, we can see, you know, the excitement in the director seeing those new images and, and, you know, being excited from the next meeting and being like, oh, that gives me a great idea, that give me a week, I'll rewrite the scene and then we can go again. And, and those moments, I mean, yeah, it's the, it's the best moments really, definitely. The exciting part in that yeah. is being able to take their product and give it back to them and say, let's level this thing up. Like, what can we do to help make this more exciting? and working with them to figure out what that process is to, yeah. um, okay, these two people enter this scene and they have a fight and what's something interesting that could happen? And then to be able to say, well, what if they tried this? Or wouldn't it be cool if you had this idea in there? And to then watch that idea travel all the way down pipe and up onto the big screen and you can say, oh, I was, yeah, you know, yeah, I, had, sure. I was able to help in, in that process yeah. and, and build that is, that's something that's so exciting, so rewarding. I think all of us, similar to you, what your point was, is we got into this because we're passionate about movies and filmmaking. And to be in, that, in those rooms and helping to facilitate those ideas, is like that's so rewarding and, and just it, it keeps that childlike passion alive of, yeah. all right, this is, this is exactly what I want to do and I get it paid for. It's incredible. Yeah. And there is, I mean, you know, it, it, there's so much strength in, you know, images and movies. I mean, people are captivated by that. And, and as much as we're in a world now, there is so much content, right? Sitting in a movie theater and watching a movie, it's such an experience. Uh, even, you know, to narrow it down to being in a museum and watching a painting, which is, you know, kind of something similar, that people are so attracted to that. And there's something visceral and, and that for us being part of that and pushing this thing and, and serving this to, to people and helping directors and filmmakers to get to this type of content, it's incredibly exciting for sure, yeah. yeah. We recently did a project as a company that started in the visualization studio and kind of hit every mark on the way and mm -hmm. actually is almost out, out the door. Um, we started with, I mean, fill in for me here, we started with 
concepts. Just concepts, yeah. Very early rough sketches to very complex design steps. Uh, every steps of the way, we, you know, making sure that uh, we, we, we got really, we hung on, on something very original and very different. And so it, it forced us to really evaluate and design and, and troubleshoot and redesign the whole thing that, and that came out with actually rewriting the script at the same time. So everything was constantly evolving and, and it's still evolving because then you came in and then it was evolving, you know, again. And, and yeah, it was, uh, it's a very exciting. Uh, exciting well, I think that's the, the cool part about that is then you get to just hand that imagery off to mm -hmm. us and, and we sit down and have the conversation. Okay. What has everybody decided on? Where can get the, the director involved in that? And like, where is this going? What is this character? How does this character move? And then you start to see like the first instances where the, the concept you did pulls out into 3D and let's, mm -hmm. this, based on this, this character's physiology, he move, he's animated in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. And to start to see that move and like, oh, that, mm -hmm. the, the excitement you get from that. What if we tried this with that? What if we did that? It, there's something there that's, that's so exciting. So thank you, Patrick, Leon. You have to get back to work. <laughs> <laughs>